Krishna Bhakti Prade Devi Satyavachai Namo Namaha <coughs> Panchatatvatmakam Krishnam Bhakta Rupaswarupakam Bhaktavataram Bhaktakyam Namami Bhakta Shaktikam Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasadi Gaubhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Shishi Guru Gauranga Gandhari Kagiri Dhari Shishi Radha Gudinda Jiu Kiri Jai First of all, I'm offering my unlimited dandavat pranams and my Shuradha Pushpanjali at the lotus feet of my most worshipable beloved Gurudev. Nityalila Pravishtom Vishnu Par Paramahansa Astatarasata Sri Srila A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Maharaj Srila Prabhupada 
then I'm offering my same unlimited danda but pranams and my shraddha pushpanjalis at the lotus feet of my most worshipable beloved Sikh Gurudevs, Nitya Lila Pradishta, Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Asto Tarasata, Sri Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Goswami Maharaj, and Nitya Lila Pradishta, Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Asto Tarasata, Sri Srila Bhakti Vedanta. Narayan Goswami Maharaj. And I'm offering my Dandavat Pranams to the lotus feet of all of my Sri Sri Rupa Nuga Guru Varga. And I'm offering my Dandavat Pranams to all of the Vaishnavas and all of the Vaishnavis. So, we're continuing reading from the Nectar of Devotion, Chapter 4. Devotional service surpasses all liberation. And we read yesterday how it is mentioned in the Hayashir Shapancharaka that after Nishringadev wanted to give benedictions to Prahlad Maharaj, then Prahlad did not accept any material benediction. And he simply asked the favor of the Lord to remain his eternal devotee. Uh, in this connection, Prahlad Maharaj cited the example of Hanuman, the eternal servitor of Lord Ramachandra, who also set an example by never asking any material favor from the Lord. He always remained engaged in the Lord's service. That is the ideal character of Hanuman, for which he is still worshipped by all devotees. Prahlad Maharaj also offered his respectful obeisances unto Hanuman. There is also a well-known verse spoken by Hanuman in which he says, My dear Lord, if you like, you can give me salvation from this material existence and or the privilege of merging into your existence. But I do not wish any of these things. I do not want anything which diminishes my relationship with you as servant to master, even after liberation. So he will not trade. <laughs> and in a similar passage in the Narada Pancharatra, it is stated, My dear Lord, I do not wish any perfectional stage by performing the ritualistic religious ceremonies or by economic development or by sense gratification or liberation. I do not wish any of these perfection, perfectional stages. I simply pray that you grant me the favor of keeping me under your Lord's feet. I do not wish any kind of liberation, such as Salokya, to reside on your planet. This is a very interesting message. What? I missed his friend. This, this, this is Narada. a passage in the Narada Pancharata. It doesn't say who's speaking it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's saying... I do not wish any kind of liberation, such as Salokya, residing in your planet, Sarupya, to have the same bodily features as you. I simply pray for your favor, that I may be always engaged in your loving service. Now, <clears throat> similarly, in the sixth canto, 14th chapter, verse 5 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Maharaj Parikshit inquires from Shukadeva Goswami. He says, My dear Brahmana, I understand that the demon Vritrasura was a greatly sinful person. 
and that his mentality was completely absorbed in the modes of passion and ignorance. Well, how did he develop to such a perfectional stage of devotional service to Narayan? I have heard that even great persons who have undergone severe austerities and who are liberated with full knowledge, they must strive to become devotees of the Lord. But it is understood that such persons are very rare and almost never to be seen. So I am astonished that Vritrasura became such a devotee. So in the above verse, Prabhupada is saying, the most important thing to be noted is that there may be many liberated persons who have merged into the existence of the impersonal Brahman. There may be. But a devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan, is very, very rare. Even out of millions of liberated persons, only one is fortunate enough to become a devotee. In Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 8th chapter, verse 20, Queen Kunti is praying to Lord Krishna at the time of his departure. Where was he going? Dwarka. Yes, it was after the battle of Kurukshetra. Or was it? Yeah, I think so. So now, Queen Kunti prayed, my dear Krishna, you are so great that you are inconceivable even to great stalwart scholars and paramahansas. So, if such great sages who are transcendental to all the reactions of material existence, if they are unable to know you, then as far as we are concerned, belonging to the less intelligent woman class, how is it possible for us to know your glories? How can we understand you? So in this verse, the particular thing to be noted is that the personality of Godhead is not understood by great liberated persons, but only by devotees such as Queen Kunti in her humbleness. Although she was a woman, and was considered less intelligent than a man, still, she realized the glories of Krishna. That is the purport of this verse. Another passage, which is very important, is in Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 7th chapter, verse 10. And it is called the Atmarama verse. You know the Atmarama verse? Yes, tell. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. To know the first line is very good. To get rid of love and give me grace. Put the first line in the air. Who did who did Mahaprabhu discuss the Atmarama Shloka with? Yeah. Is he the only one that Mahaprabhu discussed the Atmarama Shloka with? With Ramananda Roy. No. Isn't it a, is it a, did this take place when he was describing, was it um, in South India? Keshi Mubarak? No. Prakashananda. Very Como. Yeah, like crazy. <laughs> no, she's, she said already around oh, the road. Sanatana Goswami. <sighs> Mahaprabhu told me at the end of the Sanatana Siksha. Very extensive explanation there. Right? So, in that verse called the Atmarama verse, it is stated that even those who are completely liberated, this is the whole important thing about it. Before I go further, let's test your memory further. 
what's the meaning of the of the Atmarama Shloka? What is it saying? If you can't remember the Sanskrit, what is it what is it talking about? Why is it such an important shloka that Mahaprabhu would explain it in sixty-four different ways? Even though it's the self set. Yeah, oh yeah. So like the Bhagavad Gita verse where he says even of those who are perfected on their feet, know me in, in truth. It's, it's somewhat, but those, not. Those who are self satisfied. Yeah, because what does Atmaram mean? Self satisfied. Yeah, satisfied in what? The self. Atma. Enjoying, the body? The enjoying, mind? Enjoying the Atma, the soul. Ram, yes, the completely realized, perfected in their understanding of Atma Tattva, Atma Gyan. They've realized. That's why they're called Atmaramas, because they have no connection with material external enjoyment, they're enjoying internally in the level of the Atma, of the true eternal self. So, Atmaramas chamunayo nirgrantiyapi urukrame. Here, Krishna is called Urukrama. I can remember that. <laughs> so, hmm? So what the point about this Atmarama Shloka, so it is stated that even those who are completely liberated from material contamination, completely, they are attracted by what? Itam Bhuta Guno Hari. What does that mean? Topics of Hari. Huh? Topics about Hari. The qualities of Hari. They are attracted by the transcendental qualities of Krishna. That's what Prabhupada is saying here. Who is attracted? Not ordinary mundane persons. No. Atmaramas. Great munis. Great rishis. Who have realized fully. They have complete freedom from any material contamination. But they become attracted to the transcendental qualities of Krishna. Which proves what? That they're transcendental qualities. Yes, because otherwise Atmaramas cannot be attracted. That's the significant point about this shloka. Hmm? So the purport of this verse, we'll now hear from Prabhupada. The purport of this verse is that a liberated soul has absolutely no desire at all for material enjoyment. He's liberated. He is wholly freed from all kinds of material desires, yet still he is irresistibly attracted by the desire to hear and understand the pastimes of the Lord. We may therefore conclude that the glories and the pastimes of the Lord are not material. Otherwise, how could the liberated persons know, that, who are known as Atmaramas, be attracted by such pastimes? That is the important point in this verse. Now, from the above statement, it is found that a devotee is not after any of the stages of liberation. There are five stages of liberation already explained. One, to become one with the Lord. Two, to live on the same planet as the Lord. Three, to obtain the same bodily features as the Lord. Four, to have the same opulences as the Lord. And five, to have constant association with the Lord. Now, out of these five liberated stages, the one which is known as Sayuja, or to merge into the existence of the Lord, is the last to be accepted by a devotee. <clears throat> the other four liberations, although not desired by devotees, but still they are not against the devotional ideals. Some of the liberated persons who have achieved these four stages of liberation, they may also develop affection for Krishna and be promoted to the Goloka Vrindavan planet in the spiritual sky. In other words, those who are already promoted to the Vaikuntha planets 
and who possess the four kinds of liberation, they may also sometimes develop affection for Krishna and become promoted to Krishna Loka. That's a pretty important statement, is it not? Why is that important? No, we would understand that in Vaikuntha they hadn't received their eternal sarup. And so when given the opportunity to associate with those from Vrindavan, they were attracted. I agree. Yes. That's right. Hmm? So, so yes. uh, I don't know this so well. What? I don't know this so well. No, what? Uh, that point that uh, it's a little confusing. Which point? You were mind elaborating. It's uh, the part that uh, that a Vaikuntha Vasi isn't in their eternal identity. That's what it says right here. I, this praman from the lips of Srila Prabhupada is a very important sentence. Actually, there's two sentences. He says, some of the liberated persons, that means Atmaramas, who have achieved already these four stages of liberation, they may also develop affection for Krishna and be promoted to the Goloka Vrindavan planet in the spiritual sky. In other words, those who are already promoted to the Vaikuntha planets and who possess the four kinds of liberation, they may also sometimes develop affection for Krishna and become promoted to Krishna Loka. Is, can you be more clear than this? That must mean there's kirtan in the Vaikuntha planets about... Uh, well, you can Raj, assume whatever you Raj want Raj to assume. <laughs> okay, we've heard different things. Sometimes people like Narada Muni go there. But the point is, from there, even they have sarupya, everything. If they become attracted to Krishna, they can go there. I'm going to remember this that's, sentence. That's something I don't understand, though. Like, because because it, it leads to uh, it leads to some complications, like some like so-called what? complications. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like. <laughs> Like, for instance, like uh, in Raghavart Machandrika, it's described that in order to attain Braj, one has to be born by a Braj Gopi in the manifest Leela so they can understand these things and it doesn't disrupt the Leela. Whereas in that situation, you're kind of, at least according to the mundane mind, you kind of get the image of someone just popping into Goloka with no prior uh, setup, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, like you just said, these are all material <laughs> limitations, okay? <laughs> this is talking about completely different situation. Point that we should begin to try to understand. We won't be able to fully understand it because there's a huge topic and there's lots of praman and evidence being mined right now and collect it together, which will be presented to the Vaishnava community pretty much for the first time. And very soon that is coming, okay? But uh, here is a direct statement that from Vaikuntha, sometimes it may happen. They become attracted to Krishna, they can go there. Well, in the instance which um, Prabhu was describing that's in the material world that one gets that promotion but here it's speaking about yes. residents of Aikudna. Yes, that's the point. So in Sanatan Goswami's uh, Bhagavatamrita, Gopa, Gopa Kumar, he also uh, yes. goes there but that's right. satisfied. Him. That's right. Yes, good point. Prabhupada goes a little further in the next paragraph. He says, so those who are in the four liberated states may still be going through different stages of existence. In the beginning, they may want the opulences of Krishna, but at the mature stage, the dormant love for Krishna exhibited in Vrindavan becomes prominent 
in their hearts. And as such, the pure devotees never accept the liberation of Sayujya, to become one with the Supreme. Though, so, sometimes they may accept as favorable to the other four liberated states. Sorry, they may accept as favorable the other four liberated states. Now, out of many kinds of devotees, out of many kinds of devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the one who is attracted to the original form of the Lord, Krishna, in Vrindavan, is considered to be the foremost, first class devotee. Such a devotee. He is never attracted by the opulences of Vaikuntha or even of Dwarka, the royal city where Krishna ruled. So the conclusion of Sri Rupa Goswami is that the devotees who are attracted by the pastimes of the Lord in Gokul or Vrindavan are the topmost devotees. Now a devotee who is attached to a particular form of the Lord, he does not wish to redirect his devotion to other forms. For example, Hanuman, the devotee of Lord Ramachandra, he knew that there is no difference between Lord Ramachandra and Lord Narayan. He knew. And yet he still wanted to render service only unto Lord Ramachandra. That is due to the specific attraction of a particular devotee. There are many, many forms of the Lord, but Krishna is still the original form. Though all of the devotees of the different forms of the Lord are in the same category, still it is said that those who are devotees of the Lord Krishna, they are the topmost in the list of all devotees. End of chapter 4. Devotional service surpasses all liberation. And that's exactly what the class is an example of. Mm -hmm. The what? It was a classic example of that. It was Arizona. Mm -hmm. It was a liberated yes. person. And mm -hmm. as soon as they saw a lunch now, he was finished. Yes, he is definitely prime example. Yes. Atmaram. So, that was an intense chapter. Hearing the prayers of so many different personalities. Because they're in the high stage of relishing their relationship with Krishna. And therefore, they're completely free from any desires separate from serving the Lord. In their relationship. Nothing else they want to ask. We're going there. <laughs> We're heading there. So now the next chapter, chapter five, uh, is called The Purity of Devotional Service. I'm just going to read a few of the titles of these coming chapters. So the first chapter was the characteristics of pure devotional service. Then chapter 2, the first stages of devotion. Chapter 3, eligibility of the candidate for accepting devotional service. Chapter 4, devotional service surpasses all liberation. That's where we're up to. Now, uh, chapter 5 is titled The Purity of Devotional Service, how pure it is. Then chapter six is how to discharge devotional service. Seven, evidence regarding devotional principles. Eight, offenses to be avoided. So in those chapters then, uh, how to discharge. The 64 limbs will be described and so forth. Then the 64 offenses to be avoided. Yes. So a lot of nectar 
is waiting for us. But just see how much there is, even in the very beginning. Right? We haven't even touched the whole science of rasa yet. Uh -huh. So, now on chapter 5, the purity of devotional service. <clears throat> All of the previous instructions imparted by Srila Rupa Goswami in his broad statements, they can all be summarized thus. As long as one is materially inclined or desirous of merging into the spiritual effulgence, one cannot enter into the realm of pure devotional service. That's the summary. Next, Rupa Goswami states that devotional service is transcendental to all material considerations and that it is not limited to any particular country, class, society, or circumstance. As stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, devotional service is transcendental and has no cause. Ahotuki, no cause. Devotional service is executed without any hope for gain, and it cannot be checked by any material circumstances. It is open for all without any distinction, and it is the constitutional occupation of the living entities. Now, in the Middle Ages, after the disappearance of Lord Chaitanya's uh, great associate, Lord Nityananda, a class of priestly persons claimed to be the descendants of Nityananda, calling themselves the Goswami caste. And they further claimed that the practice and spreading of devotional service belonged only to their particular class, which was known as Nityananda Vamsha. In this way, they exercised their artificial power for some time, until who came on the scene? Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, the powerful Acharya of the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, completely smashed their idea. There was a great, hard struggle for some time, but it has turned out successfully. And it is now correctly and practically established that devotional service is not restricted to a particular class of men. Besides that, anyone who is engaged in devotional service is already at the status of being a high-class Brahmana. So, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's struggle for this movement has come out successful. It is on the basis of his position that anyone can now become a Gaudiya Vaishnava from any part of the world or any part of the universe. Anyone who is a pure Vaishnava he is situated transcendentally. And therefore, the highest qualification in the material world, namely to be in the mode of goodness, it has already been achieved by such a person. Our Krishna consciousness movement in the Western world is based on the above-mentioned proposition of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada, our spiritual master. And on his authority, we are claiming members from all sections of the Western countries. The so-called Brahmanas, they claim that one who is not born into a Brahmin family cannot receive the sacred thread and cannot become a high-grade Vaishnava. But we do not accept such a theory because it is not supported by Rupa Goswami nor by the strength of the various scriptures. Srila Rupa Goswami specifically mentions herein that every man 
has the birthright to accept devotional service and to become Krishna conscious. He has given many evidences from many scriptures and he has especially quoted one passage from the Padma Purana wherein the sage Vashishta tells King Dilipa, he says, my dear king, everyone has the right to execute devotional service just as he has the right to take early bath in the month of Mag, December, January. So there is more evidence in the Skanda Purana, in the Kashi Kanda portion, where it is said, quote, in the country known as Mayura Dvaj, the lower caste people who are considered less than Shudras, they are also initiated in the Vaishnava cult of devotional service. And when they are properly dressed with tilak on their bodies and beads in their hands and on their necks, they appear to be coming from Vaikuntha. In fact, they look so very beautiful that immediately they surpass the ordinary brahmanas. So this is from the Skanda Purana. This is an ancient quote from the Skanda Purana from lower caste people in that particular area, right? <laughs> It applies to us especially. So thus a Vaishnava automatically becomes a Brahmana. The idea is also supported by Sanatana Goswami in his book Hari Bhakti Vilas, which is the Vaishnava Dait. Therein he has clearly stated that any person who is properly initiated into the Vaishnava cult certainly becomes a Brahmana as much as the metal known as Bell metal, Kangsa. Kangsa is the name of bell metal. As much as bell metal is turned into gold by the mixture of mercury. Huh? That statement is there in Hari Bhakti Vilas. So a bona fide spiritual master, under the guidance of authorities, can turn anyone to the Vaishnava cult so that naturally he may come to the topmost position of a Brahmana. Are you, did you want to start the RT now? Or? I'm oh. ready anytime. Okay, I'll do like five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, Srila Rupa Goswami warns, however, that if a person is properly initiated by a bona fide spiritual master, he should not think that simply by the acceptance of such initiation, his business is then finished. Have we seen that? Yes, we sure have. If after accepting the spiritual master and being initiated, one does not follow the rules and the regulations of devotional service, then he is again fallen. He is again fallen. One must be very vigilant to remember that he is the part and parcel of the transcendental body of Krishna and that it is his duty as part and parcel to give service to the whole or Krishna. And if we do not render service to Krishna, then again we fall down. In other words, simply becoming initiated does not elevate one to the position of a high class Brahmana. One has to discharge the duties and follow the regulated principles very rigidly. Yes. So Srila Rupa Goswami also says that if one is regularly discharging devotional service, there will be no question of a fall down. But even if circumstantially there is some fall down, then the Vaishnav need have nothing to do with the prayas chitta, the ritualistic ceremony for purification. If someone falls down from the principles of devotional service, he need not take to the prayas chitta performances for reformation. He is simply has to execute the rules and regulations for discharging devotional service, and this is sufficient for his reinstatement. This is the mystery of the Vaishnava cult. This is the mystery of the Vaishnava cult. Practically, there are three processes for elevating one to the platform of spiritual consciousness. What are they called? 
Yes. yes. Um, Ashtanga and Bhakti. Nope. Uh, karma, Gyan, and Bhakti. Karma, Gyan, and Bhakti. So ritualistic performances, all of those are in the field of karma. And then speculative processes are in the field of Gyan. And one who has taken to Bhakti, the devotional service of the Lord, he need have nothing to do with karma or gyan. It has been already explained that pure devotional service is without any tinge of karma or gyan. Bhakti should have no tinge of philosophical speculation or ritualistic performances. Gyana karmadi manavrata. So in this connection, Srila Rupa Goswami he gives evidence from Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th canto, 21st chapter, verse 2, in which Lord Krishna says to Uddhava, quote, The distinction between qualification and disqualification may be made in this way. Persons who are already elevated in discharging devotional service will never again take shelter of the processes of fruitive activity or philosophical speculation. If one sticks to devotional service and is conducted by regulated principles given by the authorities and acharyas, that is the best qualification. And this statement is supported in Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 5th Chapter, verse 17, wherein Sri Narada Muni advises Vyasadeva thus, quote, even if one does not execute his specific occupational duty, but immediately takes direct shelter of the lotus feet of Hari, Krishna, there will be no fault on his part, and in all circumstances his position is secure. This is the verse, Narada Muni speaking to Vyasadeva. Even if he gives up his svadharma, uh, but if he is attached to the lotus feet of the Lord, then he has not fallen. So even if by some bad association he falls down while executing devotional service, or if he doesn't finish the complete course of devotional service and dies untimely, still he is not at a loss. A person who is simply discharging his occupational duty in varna and ashrama, however, right, with no Krishna consciousness, practically does not gain the true benefit of human life. So the purport is, that all conditioned souls who are engaged very frantically in activities for sense gratification without knowing that this process will never help them get out of material contamination, they are awarded only with repeated births and deaths. Hare Krishna. Okay, we'll complete there. Shri Shri Nectar of Devotion Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Shri Rupa Goswami Pada Ki Jai